Okay. So very good afternoon to everybody, and I also thank uh, Capcom Rent Trust for organizing such a beautiful and great conference. So I will need. I, I will just take one minute to save my screen. Please allow me just one minute, right? Okay, so uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Uh, so uh, within my presentation, I would be talking about one of the most ancient indigenous group of people of our country, the Santals. Besides discussing <coughs> the history and traditional practices of these people in general, the focus of my presentation would be upon a particular practice of this community, the practice of witchcraft among the women. Uh, and along with the origin and nature of such practice, I would mainly concentrate upon the story of the gender struggle latent within it, which is most often ignored by the academicians. So let me first start with the history of the settlement of the Santals in this country. Uh, sorry, ma'am, uh, we cannot yes. see your PPT. Uh, is it not visible? No, ma'am. No, ma okay, okay, let me try once again. Is it visible? Yes, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you for letting me know. So, about the uh, history, uh, we can say that the Santas are one of the largest groups of indigenous people or tribe in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, they are found in the central and eastern states of India, in Jharkhand, Bihar, Odisha, Chhattisgarh, West Bengal, and Assam, and beyond in Bangladesh, Nepal, and Bhutan. And according to the long history of ancient and modern India, they have been called by various names. The Aryans who followed and occupied the lands and cultivation called them Asus and Naushad, as is found in Ramayana and Mahabharata. The name Santal, according to script thought, was uh, actually a corruption of Shaupar, which was adopted by Shamsas when they lived in the area around Shaun, which is now identified with Simla Pargana in Midnapur district of West Bengal. Now, uh, despite this variety of names, most anthropologists agree that the Santal is a name given to this tribe by the non-Santals. In fact, Santals among themselves use the word uh, whore, which means man or human. Uh, but they had no written history until the British colonialists and Western missionaries came to India in the 18th century. Before that, they have passed on their history, customs, and traditions orally through their stories, songs, and legends, as they did not have their own script. But they have kept their language suddenly alive, even to the present day, which is one of the uh, one of the sources of pressing their origin, migration, past history, and their glories. Uh, and the Indian authors and historians uh, and also the anthropologists became interested and started to write about them after the Domenico was created in 1833. Most of the initial writings are based on the stories told by the local Shantal elders and their understanding of them. Uh, the rest are based on their opinions and perceptions and not on any firm evidence. Now, whatever may, may, may have been the original habitat of the race, there is no doubt with, about and that within the historic times, they were settled in the Chotanagpur plateau and the adjoining districts of Midnapur and Singhu. They began to make their way upwards towards the close of the 18th century. And the earliest mention of them appears to be contained in an, uh, in an article entitled Some Extraordinary Facts, Customs and Practices of the Hindus by Lord Tenmal. 
was published in the Asia Tech Research in 1795. Now, all these accounts confirm that the Santals were in India long before the arrival of Aryans, in spite of different opinions and conclusions by different authors and historians. Now, uh, I would like to talk a bit about the religion of the Santals. And talking about the religion of the Santals, there is very close link between the social structure and the religious universe of the Santals. Unless one understands the religious universe, one will not be able to analyze the Santal societal structure. For the Santals live not only in their human tribal society, but in a greater society consisting of supernatural beings as well. Naturally, their whole mindset and religiosity is set by their experience of them in their life journey. So the Santals believe that the world in which they live is inhabited by a large number of spiritual beings of various kinds, of whom they call bungas, uh, which literally means spirits. They are uh, of the opinion that they are completely surrounded by these bungas. Now, according to uh, J. Troisi, uh, J. Gosdor records the names of 178 different types of bongas who are said to be prevalent among the Santas who constantly either intervene or hinder them in their enterprises and affairs. J. Troisi himself broadly classifies them into 10 categories or classes, maintaining that the classification does not imply any notion of hierarchy in which one class is superior to the other. Uh, now, P. C. Vishwas, another renowned anthropologist, uh, esteemed the spirits as supreme, superior, and supernatural, and also classified them into nine different types. He to admits that the division could be on parallel lines, finding it difficult to distinguish the superiority or inferiority of them according to the beliefs of the Santals. He, however, unlike Troisi, begins the list of the classification with the highest divinity whom, according to him, the Santals call Chandu. He is the supreme being, the creator, the giver, and restorer of life of all kinds. Uh, Biswas then mentions the spirits of the dead ancestors, household spirits, hunting spirits, the spirits of the village boundary, then the tramp or stray mischievous spirits, and so on. Now, uh, these members of the Santal invisible world, broadly speaking, might be of two types the benevolent bongas and the malevolent ones. In the process of mentioning the benevolent bongas, Troisi starts with village tutelary spirit and starts right away with Maranguru, affirming that he is the chief of the Santal Bunga pantheon. He is the most powerful bonga, and the Santas have always venerated him as a genial and kind grandfather, propitiating him on all festivals and rites of passages. Now, the third among the village tutelary deity is Jaherera. As the name implies, she is the lady of the sacred grove, or Jahethan, for she is believed to be residing over the sacred grove. She never harms the Santals. So, this Maranguru, Murekoturuiko, and Jaherera, according to Santal belief, are very closely connected among themselves. Now, as it happens, where there is goodness, there may be the possibility of evil also. Uh, thus, along with the benevolent bongas, uh, the Santals mention some of the malevolent ones from whom only inaction is all that is expected of. See Mukherjee notes, I quote, Santals are about a number of mischievous minor spirits who find a devilish delight in bringing epidemics to men or cattle unless propitiated with appropriate uh, ritual. Troisi gathers that among the Santals, the Sima and Bahre Bunga, that is, the village boundary spirits and the village outskirts spirits, are more malevolent than all others. The most feared ones are, however, the Shima Bungas. The Bahre Bungas, um, on the other hand, decide in the area outside the village, farther away from the boundaries or in the area demarked for one particular village. Their favorite abodes being pools, tanks, ponds, places, at mainly where water is to be found. <clears throat> Santas offer sacrifices to these bongas as they go on a long journey, as they may have to pass uh, through the hill or jungle or something like that. Now, uh, the interesting fact is that the Santal community at Worsi presents itself at slightly different level. It cannot be called a community at worship in a full sense of the term, for the entire village community does not go to the place of worship. 
that is to the Jahir Khan. Women and children do not accompany the Naike or the priest. The village officials and the elders, though the sacrifices are made in the name and on behalf of the entire village community, the male members of every family can easily participate in the act of sacrifice. While the ritual sacrifice is uh, being performed at the Jahid Khan, the non-participating members of the village wait on at the outskirts of the village, making preparations for the cooking of the sacrificial meal. Women and children do not take part even in the sacrificial meal at Jahid Khan. It sounds rather strange for a community like the Santas to exclude the women and children at worship, but that is how it is. Uh, L. O. Mali reports, I quote, the religion of the Santas is essentially a man's religion. Women are not allowed to be present at sacrifices except when they are offered in the house to the ancestors and family gods, and then only if there are no men to help the sacrifice. In so far as they do not form, form part of the sacrifice, they do not form part of uh, part or among the members of that eat the sacrificial meal. A. B. Choudhury punishes part the negative side of women's exclusion from the act of worship, as he says, "I quote: Should they be allowed to worship the spirits, they would win over favor quickly." And their nature being destructive, they would invariably indulge in destructive activities to the detriment of social interest. The women may take part in the ritualistic dances at Jahitan and Majitan after the rituals are over, but they cannot actively associate themselves with the worship. And this exclusion of women at the rituals is possibly the root cause of the rise of the witchcraft. Now, um, in the American Journal of Sociology, Wilson uh, mentions the uses of witchcraft as a belief in a mystical power innate in certain individuals. It is the innate power used to work uh, evil or to harm others directly. The Adivasis made a distinction between white and black magic, where on one hand, white magic was socially and physiologically beneficial, black magic, on the other hand, was evil and maleficent. The witches are well feared as mysterious creatures and are supposed to have intercourse with the spirits, which give them the powers of killing people by eating their entrails and also causing them fever, etc. The dimes are considered to have evil eyes on a person who is then eventually taken ill. Generally, witches do not kill men with their swords and other such weapons, but by exercising some sort of hypnotism. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, can you uh, mute your speakers? The sound is disturbing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to intervene. <laughs> Uh, now, the Adivasi construction of diseases and sickness and how they are related has to do much with the urgent uh, need of elimination of the witches. One cannot ignore the Adivasi medicinal system. They have a fairly elaborate system for root medicines and herbs, which are then supplemented or substituted by prescriptions of ojas. Ojas are the ministers of the white magic with the inherent powers to counter the evil activities of the witches. Now, uh, uh, now, the vital question that arises from all these stories is that, um, do such women really exist? Nakhun and Kelke attempt to find the truth behind these beliefs in witches. Through changing context, women remain the target. They observe, talking to people of the region, there certainly is a strong belief in the existence of such women who practice a different form of worship leveled witchcraft, and thus, as per popular belief, gain certain powers to cause harm. Pio Bodin, the Norwegian missionary of the 18th century, expressed, I quote, I am inclined to think that the practice of witchcraft by Santal women is, to a certain extent, really secret worship, resorted to by women because they are not permitted to take part with the men directly and personally in ordinary public worship. Witnessing such forms of secret worship by women has also been mentioned by some reputed contemporary anthropologists. Yeah. According to Nathan and Kelker, a conflict between women-centered and men-centered uh, 
religious practices do exist among various indigenous peoples. Possibly, in course of time, the women-centered religious practices have moved from center stage to the margins. Now, talking about the origin of witch witchcraft, uh, it can be said that the both Muho and Munda share the same myths and legends. As for the belief system is concerned, they, they in fact disagree with each other on nothing. Similarly, they share their social system and historical tradition. The only possible difference may be found in the degree of exposure to the surrounding dominant Hindu society. The origin of witchcraft is narrated in the legend of Baranda Bonga. The legend, as translated and uh, described by Hoffman, reveals how the first ever known witch in the collective memory of the people is identified by two non-Munda people. She is none other than the wife of the Supreme Being, the creator of the universe, Sing Bonga. She is accused of killing Singh Bunga's son, obviously born by his other wife. Singh Bunga asks his elder brother, Baranda, to get rid of her. Baranda carries out the order obediently, but not before prov proving that she is really a witch. The legend presents um, the two witch finders uh, as possessing great magical power. They are introduced as the guru or the master teacher and the manji or the minister. Baranda approaches them to find out the cause of his nephew's sickness. Thus, he plays an important role in beginning the process of witch finding and in ending the life of the identified witch. Now, thus, the legend reveals not only an access to introduce a new system of belief into the prevailing Munda belief, but also the transformations of the Munda belief system. We may identify three phases of such transformations. In the earliest known system, uh, there are only three characters in the pantheon, Singh Bonga or the Buru Bonga, also the Supreme Being, Jahir Era, the matron of the sacred grove, and Nage Era, the matron of water. There is no evil spirit to be propitiated. In the second phase, we come across two important legends, the making of the first plow and the division of time into day and night. In them, the old one teaches the son of man the technique of making a plow and the art of tilling land. He creates the moon to carve night out of day so that the tiller can now take rest after the hard work of daytime. It tells us how the supreme being who created everything fails to make a plow properly despite his best efforts. Then his wife comes to his rescue and in no time constructs it with a much better technology than her husband. The old one accepts defeat and declares, from today I free all women from the hardship of making plows. The men shall make them and the women shall not even plow them. Now, coming to the third phase, it can be divided into two sub-phases. First, we have the Asurkani, an analysis of the, his description in this story, along with a comparative study of the growth of the Supreme Being com concept in the tradition of, the, of other groups belonging to the same indigenous community, conclusively indicates his association with the great mountain first and then the moon. In the second sub-phase, we find a number of legends and myths that gather around the new mountain spirit the Baranda. They describe the gradual association of the Supreme Being with the sun, degradation of Nage era, the matron of water, into an insignificant tutelary spirit, and a grand introduction of an elder brother of the Supreme Being, Baranda Bunga. Now the traditional practice of propitiation of good is unable to protect human beings from evil. On the social plane, women are branded as the potential keepers of the evil spirits to be killed if the newly introduced witch finders identify them as witches. Uh, Hoffman believes that a close association with a Hindu religion influenced the Munda, Munda belief system in various respects. Nathan and Kelker agree upon the exposure of the Santos to the stratified social system of the neighboring Hindu society, which is purely patriarchal. Later, Mulik also observes, it is generally observed that in more forested areas, women enjoy more equal status with men, even, they have less, even if they have less access to the cultivable land. Since the possibility and practice of foraging is quite high in these areas, women are more economically independent and less dependent on agricultural produce. On the other hand, where there is no forest left or its presence is negligible, women are at the receiving end. High dependency on agriculture leads to an assertion of women's traditional rights on family land for independent survival. 
for this assertion they incur their in-laws or even brothers wrath mullik identifies three stages of the development of beliefs among santals first belief in spirits including the ancestral ones who are benevolent the knowledge of the rituals to appease them is possessed by both men and women second an additional belief in evil spirits who are appeased by the devura separately third stage includes the belief that the human beings can become devoted to or close with the evil spirits and can control them now mullik associates these three stages of belief with the three different stages of modes of production foraging foraging come agriculture with foraging playing the dominant role and agriculture come foraging where settled agriculture is dominant now these shifting relations of production have intense influence on changing gender relations these uh, these these three stages show us the gradual development of a class struggle giving rise to the patriarchy by weakening um the female rights economic and ritual stage by stage formally women had a very significant role um in uh, to play in the agricultural and foraging process the women lead the clan while going from one stage to another they possessed a great knowledge of seeds and roots which they kept secret to women only mullik observes um i quote her knowledge of herbs and plants particularly medicinal ones is considered a precious family possession the part they played in making the land ready for cultivation is also very significant naturally uh the women's right to the newly reclaimed land and the harvest was recognized and incorporated in their customary law by the society now in this respect um let us examine the two words dan and dakan which stand for witch in santali and bilali respectively but the words have their root in the in old indo aryan word dakini interestingly the word witch comes from the anglo saxon word wicca meaning wise one or magician similarly the original meaning of the word dakini can be traced in tantra according to the tantric buddhism dakini means the female personification of a stage of wisdom uh, a popular image of the hindu goddess kali is found to be associated with many other images such as shiva uh her, her husband and uh, we have the fox her vehicle and dakini and yogini are two associates the image of dakini is that of a cold female goblin attending kali according to uh, the puranic tradition kali is prakriti the mother goddess the symbol of female principle thus if kali is deified is the deified form of the female principle dakini has to be the real form of the same and she represents female supremacy on uh, on earth in buddhist tantra durga the female deity of the aryans is called vajra dakini dakini vidya means witchcraft so her knowledge is the knowledge of the witch her mate yogini is the samanas she is also considered the personification of bhagavati we know that with the changes in gender relations from mother's right to father's right the deification of female power in the level of religion and denigration of it in the level of institutions take place in a new social order based on patriarchy in short etymologically too the word witchcraft or dynavidya has much to do with wisdom or knowledge as i have already mentioned the witches are believed to be singing and dancing together on certain occasions um they have their own songs uh, for these occasions besides they, there are songs too which are sung by the witches uh, uh sorry which are not sung by the witches by but by their opponents the ogres all these songs are called witch songs and as i am basically from the literature background i can't resist myself from interpreting witch songs from this newly found perspective so i have chosen two songs one is sung by a witch and the other is by the ogre uh, i came across these songs in while reading bowman of mid india uh, written by coppers and young blood so this is the first song and this is the second i will take them one by one um the first song is actually sung by a witch 
Uh, typically, this it delineates the typical image of a witch, naked, hungry, armed with a weapon, and the art of killing a human being. This time, she is going to eat her own husband, which is prefer to eat their nearest and dearest ones, including even their sons. Witches are accused of eating their closest male relatives. Exceptions are negligible. Obviously, eating is not literal here because the victims survive after their vital organs are taken out. A young witch must qualify for full membership by eating someone from her own family. According to the Sean, the mother-in-law teaches her son's wife to eat her own son. Taken literally, it sounds strange. So what does the expression eating signify? What actually does the mother-in-law teach her daughter-in-law? What knowledge does she pass on to the next generation? Maybe the second song can provide the answers. Uh, the second song is actually a marriage song. However, the central character is not the bridegroom, but the witch finder. The bride is called an old hag, a common name for the witches. Uh, the song describes the actions of the witch and the counteractions of the witch finder until the witch finder suffocates the witch to death by forcibly submerging her in the river. The witch kept digging a ditch. Uh, and each time the witch finder filled it up. She filled two pitchers with water, the, pitcher find, uh, the witch finder kicked and broke them. Thus, she was not allowed either to dig the earth or store water. What could be the possible purpose of doing this? The action of digging and watering earth immediately evokes images of agriculture. Then, was the attempt to cultivate land being opposed? It seems to be so. The conflict finally resulted in her defeat. We find her trying to escape, but she was finally caught and put to death by the witch finder. The witch stands for women's right to knowledge and access to cultivation, and the witch finder represents the male dominance over land, knowledge, and agriculture in the community. Now, did she commit any crime by digging the earth and storing water for its irrigation? If so, how does that harm the interest of the male? These questions bring us close to only one answer. C, like other women in general, is not supposed to cultivate land anymore. She does not have the right to access land and water because men have usurped their, that right. If this is the message of the song, that, then it is not difficult to understand the purpose of singing this song during the marriage ceremony. Obviously, the purpose is to caution the young bride against nurturing any such thought about claiming her husband's property. In the indigenous setting, the most important form of property is land and water resources. The song makes sense only if it, only if it is seen in this context. It is, in fact, a superb example of the ritual humiliation of women expressing the male ideology of the indigenous society. So it can be said, as Malik says, that the witch stands for women's right to knowledge and access to cultivation. And the witch finder represents the male dominance over land, knowledge, and agriculture in the community. So for the sake of strengthening male domination in the society, such knowledge had to be opposed. As a precautionary measure uh, to the spirits, the witches in their nightly adventures do all those things denied to them in the delight. They access the sacred grove, worship the spirits, offer sacrifices to them, mock cultivate and forage food items, and so on. According to Mundi, the witch is engaged in a gory struggle for a survival as a woman. She is fighting against all the taboos imposed on her and is trying to retain her power and status and protect the social system that sanctions them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. It was a, a wonderful uh, presentation on the practice of witchcraft. And uh, to be very frank, this is a be. I am a tarot card reader, so this uh, witchcraft is very close to me uh, because often people in my vicinity think that being a tarot card reader, you are a witch also. Okay. And, uh, talking about but i am not a witch 
uh, talking yes. about uh, okay. uh, Buddhist, Buddhist Tantrism, I remember that yes. one of the scholars has done PhD on it in University of Jammu under my mother. So uh, these, whatever the facts and the figures and the practices that you told about the women, uh, I think they are being practiced in almost all the communities. Because um, when uh, the, that scholar was working on that perspective, I was doing some extra research and I learned about Ipsita Roy Chakravarti, who, who has declared herself uh, a witch, and uh, Mihela yes, Minka, yes. who is a Rumi Romanian woman, Mihela Minka and Ipsita Roy Chakravarti. And uh, it is very strange to understand that they don't share their knowledge with their male heir. Yeah, that's a, they, yeah that, that is the problem. Oh, yeah, they, the male you were talking about. Yeah, about uh, Mihila Minka and Ipsita. Everywhere, in almost every uh, community, they prefer women and women transfer it to their daughter, not to the son. Yeah, that is the tradition. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, so, uh, I couldn't get yes. your question actually. No, it, no, I'm just giving a feedback. That okay, this okay, is okay. The... <laughs> oh, actually, the sound so, uh, is not clear. It's a breaking, so uh, all okay, uh, okay, what okay, I was okay, saying okay, is okay. not clearly uh, audible. Okay. Okay, okay. So it was a wonderful presentation. No, I think uh, um, if someone has Thank any uh, question, they can ask. Um, does someone have any question? Uh, Abhimanyu, uh, we have a question from uh, President uh, Lavender, uh, Lavender Literary Club, Dr. Frank Thurston. He says that uh, uh, data says that Santhals migrated in India in 18th century. How we can consider migrants as indigenous people? Yes. Uh, can you repeat your question? Uh, that data says that Santhals migrated in, in India in 18th century. How can we consider migrants as indigenous people? No, data doesn't say that they migrated from somewhere else into the 18th century. They were here even before at the age of Ramayana and Mahabharata. The Ashurs are actually the indigenous people. So uh, I don't know where did you get the data, data about uh, that 18th century thing. Ma'am, most probably they were recorded by British in the 18th century. Yeah, before 18th century, nothing was recorded about them. Yeah, this, the, 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 that is actually the thing. It because, doesn't mean that they migrated in the 18th century yeah, from somewhere because else. Because tribes don't have the uh, tradition of writing histories. Yeah, that, that is the, what I have mentioned, that uh, before 18th yes. century, they didn't have any written history or um, culture, tradition, whatever you may say. It was after the 18th century, after the um, uh, certain establishment of the Dominico, that the anth historians and anthropologists became interested in them, and they began to record them. Yes, they are the original inhabitants. But that, that, that doesn't uh, deny their existence even before 18th century. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, any other question? I think, ma'am, uh, the your presentation was really wonderful, and there is no other question. When people don't have question, it means they understood everything, whatever you wanted to convey. <laughs> that is my pleasure. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. And personally speaking, it was a pleasure listening to you. I have taken down each and every word that I could from your session because, um, as I told you, this is a very topic close to my heart, also. Uh, thank you for giving okay, us then, a very uh, then you can later con contact me. We can discuss about it later in detail. Certainly, so ma'am. Yeah, even I can learn something from you. I hope. Yeah. Sure, certainly we will. We will. Um, thank you so much, ma'am.